Hello, and I'm delighted to be joined today by a pioneer in cardiology, Dr. Keith Fox, who's recently also won the Queen's Anniversary Award, which we'll talk about a little bit later on in the interview. But very welcome today, Dr. Fox. Thanks very much, Harriet. And uh, I want to stress that it's our, our team in Edinburgh that uh, were very glad to win this award. And it's a, it's a great tribute to uh, three different lines of research that our, our group has been following. Oh, thanks so much for clarifying all that as well. But we will talk a little bit more about the research went behind that later on in the interview. But also to mention that, I mean, it's just one of many awards that you've won. I'll just reel a few off. There's a gold medal by the European Society of Cardiology in recognition of your outstanding achievements. And in 2010 and 2014, you received a silver medal from the European Society of Cardiology. And in 2013, you also achieved the McKenzie Medal um, of the British Cardiovascular Society. So quite a, <laughs> a few accolades. It's, amazing. it's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I had to read them all because there's no way I could memorise all of that. <laughs> but Dr. Fox, um, can we pedal back a little bit and talk about your upbringing and what, who your influences were and what led you to cardiology in the first place? Well, um, I, I must say, Harriet, that it, uh, cardiology wasn't in the front of my mind. You know, growing up, uh, I was born in Central Africa in Zimbabwe and grew up in Zimbabwe and Malawi. So cardiology certainly wasn't in uh, the forefront of my mind. And uh, nobody in the family was in medicine. Uh, my father was in the bank and moved around. So that's how I, I grew up there and went to local schools out there, but was very interested in biology and in science. So I guess that was the start of it. Okay. And then I took uh, a gap year between school and university and worked in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Malawi. Um, first in the labs and then in the outpatient trauma and so on. And that was really quite a formative experience. Okay. Um, and so what, when you first started in, in your career in research, what were the first things that you were working on then? Well, I, I guess I got interested in research, um, uh, you know, uh, during my undergraduate uh, medical um, curriculum. Okay. And I did a, an intercalated degree in in uh, immunology and in pathology and was very interested in, in the mechanisms. And um, at that stage, still had no idea that I would be uh, going towards cardiology. And I guess uh, also at that time, um, the prevalent information about what happened to people with ST elevation myocardial infarction is about half of them died within 30 days of their index event. And this was really shocking. And, you know, most of the treatments were aimed at just amelioration of the complications, not dealing with the problem. So there was a real challenge there. OK. And when we spoke um, before, you were talking about the discovery of TPA as a thrombolytic agent. Um, that was back in those early days, wasn't it, when you were beginning your research? It was a, a very exciting time. Yeah. Um, clearly, clearly there'd been streptokinase around, but streptokinase had all sorts of complications because people could have antibodies and it didn't work in a proportion of people if you have antibodies. Okay. So uh, this was at a time when I was doing a fellowship in the, in the US, in Washington University in St. Louis. And um, we had developed some techniques to look at myocardial blood flow and myocardial metabolism. And we were approached by a group from Leuven in Belgium to test out a molecule that was derived from a melanoma cancer cell line. And they said they weren't sure if it was going to work or not. <laughs> but actually, that turned out to be melanoma TPA. And we did the animal studies first and then the, uh, the first clinical studies. So that was a very exciting time. Oh, fantastic. And then what came out? I know you sort of mentioned um, about the recovery of the myocardium. Was that the next phase? In terms of yes, I, I, I think what really came out of a lot of the research on metabolism and, and perfusion okay. was the critically important time dependence uh, in that the shorter the time that uh, the patient experiences profound ischemia, um, the greater the recovery. So a lot of the efforts were aiming to have very rapid reperfusion, initially with thrombolytic agents and now with uh, primary PCI uh, interventional techniques. Okay, so um, what what other areas were you involved in in your with your research at that time? Well, as a, most of my research at that time was basic science research, okay. looking at perfusion and metabolism, but then developing the work on 
uh, some early work on imaging, and we were doing some positron emission tomography, okay. looking at, at the myocardium and looking at its its recovery. So th th that was the basis. And uh, I spent uh, five years with my family uh, in uh, uh, Washington University in, in St. Louis. So that was that was a great time. Oh. And what about the the newer anticoagulants? You were involved in that as well, weren't you? Um, yes, uh, I was, and um, with others in the UK, I was involved in some of the studies of both the the heparins, the low molecular weight heparins, the hirudins, and now the anti ten A's. Okay. So the, the the revolution that there's been is uh, inhibiting thrombosis after the index event or during the early stages of both ST elevation infarction and non ST elevation infarction, and that's moved on more recently to the use of the anti A's in atrial fibrillation. So uh, uh, we have been involved in some of the, and co-chairing one of the big studies in that field. Okay. And what about um, the prevention um, aspect? I know you're very um, passionate about that as well. Yes. Um, uh, you know, I I'm, I'm, would never put a hold up my hand and say I was an expert in prevention, but I, I really feel, you know, as cardiologists, we must do um, our share of that. And I was involved um, in, in my spare time with the organization ASH, which is the anti-smoking uh, organization. And I, I chaired the committee of ASH, and I'm now president of ASH in Scotland. And uh, we were delighted to be one of the uh, key lobby groups uh, to get the uh, cessation of smoking in public places through in Scotland. And th this is now the 10th anniversary on the 26th of March. And it's been a revolution. That's because amazing. it's amazing how law-abiding people have been and, and the impact both on respiratory disease and on cardiovascular disease. It really has been incredible. And do you see um, that making even further strides in the next decade as well? Yes, we're very ambitious. We want mm -hmm. to have a smoke-free generation okay. so that irrespective of which socioeconomic group somebody is, is born into, he or she would not be exposed to significant cigarette smoke in their lifetime. Okay. And that's really quite an ambitious uh, uh, proposition. So I, get, I guess um, we'd have to have the companies involved with that as well to stop them selling cigarettes as well and really go back to the there, There's basics. a few challenges. <laughs> a few hurdles. But yeah. you've got to aim high, haven't you? And yes. hopefully that will happen. Okay, so let's move forward a little bit more to your current research because that's the basis for your um, recent uh, Queen's Anniversary Prize as well. Can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Well, th th there, there are a few different parts to that. Um, the parts that I was uh, directly leading were in what we call the GRACE program, which is the a Global Registry of Acute Coronary Events. And um, I set this up with a co-chair from the University of Massachusetts, and we were very fortunate to get leading individuals from around the world to give their time for nothing to be part of the steering committee. And the reason for it was that we had no robust information at that time about what uh, acute coronary syndromes were, how they were defined, uh, how they were managed, and what the outcomes were, and if we could identify the high-risk features. So that's what we did. And uh, we set off for a, a program that thought would last a couple of years, and actually it lasted 10 years okay. with 102,000 patients in 30 countries. And from that, we derived the GRACE risk score, and that's widely used internationally in guidelines. So that helps in the management of patients with non-SD elevation ACS. So GRACE is part of it. Um, some of our group in Edinburgh have a lot of work on pollution and cardiovascular effects. That was part of it. And we also have done studies in high sensitive troponin and heart attacks and the impact of those. So the, those three elements were the key elements within the uh, winning the um, Queen's Anniversary uh, uh, Prize. Oh, that's, uh, they're amazing achievements and um, incredible progress in cardiology. But lots more to do. Yeah, as ever. Yeah. <laughs> Talking of which, if you had a crystal ball, what would be your predictions for progress in cardiology in the coming years? Well, you know, the, the, the approach we've taken in cardiology is a blanket approach. So if you've got high blood pressure or if you've got hyperlipidemia or if you've got some other condition, the idea is that we treat everybody and that this will be successful. And there's a lot to be said for that. And it, it does work. But I think we need to learn from oncology okay. because oncology is far more targeted and specific. 
And I suspect 10 years from now, both in terms of our phenotype characteristics and our genotype, we'll be able to tailor the treatments much more to the individual. And the really exciting things that some of our work is pointing towards is the idea that we can identify plaques before they ruptured and the inflammation within plaques before they ruptured so that we can specifically target those. Okay. I mean, that would be amazing, wouldn't it, to get them? It would be amazing. Yeah. But anyway, that hopefully will be what will happen in the next decade. Or what's the time scale we're looking at, do you think? What's the time scale? (laughs) Get that crystal ball out again. Yes, yeah. Well, I mean, the the first thing is is trying to find out whether the um, we can adequately imaging and identify uh, the plaques that are susceptible to rupture. Because in the past, what we've done is we've simply selected the ones that are very tightly stenosed. Okay. And yet we know that that's not all of the ones that uh, lead to rupture. And the exciting thing is identifying some of the markers of inflammation and plaque disruption that we may be able to target with new imaging devices, oh, okay. uh, inc- including the work that my colleague uh, David Newby and his group are doing on PET CT imaging, which is very exciting. Fantastic. Okay. Well, talking of um, up and coming cardiologists now, what advice would you have for them in terms of where to carry research and, and any advice you might have for them? Well, um, my advice would be that this is an amazingly exciting field. Mm-hmm. That, that There are people who feel, okay, box is ticked for acute cardiology okay. because you know if we look at the um, the government targets for the decline in death rates these have been exceeded right but, okay. but what we've missed out on mm-hmm. is the long term consequences of uh, that occur in people with uh, prior heart attack people with cardiovascular disease okay. and actually changing those long term consequences is of fundamental importance and i think there's really exciting possibilities in um, bespoke treatments for individuals in the future. Okay, so that's the area that, um, you know, new up-and-coming cardiologists can go, you know, veer towards, as it were. Yes, and I I think the the critical issue is basing it on uh, a reliable basis on the science of what's happening in the plaques and in the wall, and then being able to work back from that. Okay. Do you have um, um, some up-and-coming cardiologists working in your team at the moment? Uh, there are some terrific people that, that were part of the team and okay. uh, uh, they were with us when we went down to London for that recent event. Oh, fantastic. We're lucky to be working with you. Well, it's a, it's a great team. Oh, fantastic. Um, okay, so moving on from cardiology, can we just touch on some of your personal achievements, if we may? Because I know <laughs> they've been quite great as well. <laughs> Maybe you could like to oh. tell everyone about your, your recent one, which involved bikes. Oh, bikes. Well, <laughs> Um, I, I certainly wouldn't rank that as a, as a major achievement at all. Which, well, I, um, I would if it was me. Uh, well, uh, my son and I did the uh, Caledonian Etape, okay. uh, which is it's like one of the stages of the Tour de France in, um, in part of central Scotland. So there are some significant hills and uh, about uh, 135k uh, to cycle, which um, would be not too bad, apart from the fact it was a terrible day when we last did it. Oh, was but it? Uh, my son and I are going to do it again in a couple of months' time this year. It's, it's May, isn't it? It's, co- it's coming up. It's May, yes. So presumably you've had to train quite hard, given it's such a long well, distance. That's, that, that's the plan. <laughs> oh, you haven't started yet? <laughs> no, no, I have actually. Because <laughs> well, it's only in May, isn't it? As it I understand. It's, quite, it's pretty May. soon. Is it, is it, do you have sponsorship for that? Do people, can people sponsor? Yes, sponsored? Um, it, it was uh, the last time we did it for the Marie Curie, and it's going to be Marie Curie again. Oh, so fantastic. we were able to to raise quite a lot of money for that, which is okay. great. Do you have a donate page on the internet that people can um, go I to? haven't set that up yet, but okay. uh, I think we will, yeah. Oh, when, when you do, perhaps we can sort of put a link to it under this video, which would be quite great. Great, thank you, oh. thanks. But talking about that, um, so, thank you so much for joining us today, but is there, where can people find out more about you and your work at the moment? Do you have a website or somewhere they can um, turn to? I don't have a personalised website, okay. <laughs> but uh, certainly on, on Google um, I can be found and the publications found or in PubMed, but um, in terms of the work of the group, um, the Centre for Cardiovascular Science at the University of Edinburgh would okay. give you a lot of background as to what the, it's really quite a substantial group now. When I, when I came to Edinburgh, there were only 
about uh, less than 10 people doing cardiovascular research. Right. And we now have about 200. So it's, oh uh, it's a remarkable change. Yeah, that is a huge, yeah, very big change. Well, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on today. And, um, you know, we're, we're so grateful for the progress that you've made in cardiology. I know I speak for, for more than myself. Um, we wouldn't, you know, be making such huge strides if it wasn't for pioneers in cardiology such as yourself. So thank you for that. Harriet, thank you. Just a small cog in a, in a big task. Oh, well, I don't know about that. I think it's more a bigger cog. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much for joining us and just for our viewers to let you know that um, this interview will be is on our website in the the media gallery section on the home page which you can find at radcliffecardiology.com so thank you so much for joining us today and it just remains me to say thank you to dr fox once more and goodbye and have a great day thanks very much Bye, thanks Harry. for joining us today bye-bye bye-bye